one of the songs that Bill found for us was a song called High Tech Redneck. Okay, so we recorded High Tech Redneck at the, at the studio I was working at there at the recording workshop on the, you know, on the weekends when we had our, our, our available time to do that. And we were playing it. We, we had a house job locally there, and we were playing this song out live, High Tech Redneck, and people were loving it and were like, man, we have got the song. This is the song that's going to start Hank Law off onto the road you know so anyway so we you know we were, our local following was listen th this song high tech redneck and they're like we love this song we record it and we're sh and, and 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 bill Harrison is shopping us uh with it around nashville and and bill calls us one day one day calls me um and uh says you guys have to stop record stop playing that song um because it, there's an artist in town his name's george jones and, and George Jones is going to record and release that song. Not only is he going to release that song, but that's going to be the title of his next record. Up and down Broadway, across the avenues, East Nashville to West End, Belneed and Bellevue, Midtown, Franklin, Green Hills, Redwood, Donaldson, and Hendersonville. The people, the places, the lifestyle. Welcome to the Pod 615 with your host, William Kitchens. Today on this backstage episode, William speaks with Tony Cottrell of Lonely Dog Productions. Tony is an exceptional live music and studio recording engineer, as well as a touring manager, who has worked with an impressive list of music industry clients. Currently, Tony is the production and front of house engineer for the former American Idol star and Broken Bow Records recording artist, L.B. Shane. Prior to that, Tony worked with the country music supergroups, Exile and Diamond Rayo. Other artists and clients have included Ronnie Millsap, Earl Thomas Conley, Jamie Johnson, The Turtles, Shelley Wright, Vince Gill, Larry Gatlin, and the Gatlin Brothers, Leon Redbone, Tanya Tucker, and more. In early 2023, this busy music industry professional will once again man the audio booth for the Jimmy Bowen and Friends television series. Now in its sixth season, William has known Tony for over 25 years. They caught up at Tony's Lonely Dog Productions studio in Gallatin, Tennessee, where he is currently engineering tracks for an upcoming album release from Exile. All right, I'm here today with Tony Cottrell, who has a huge resume. We've known mm -hmm. each other since, what, about 1994? I met you. 1994, it doesn't seem that long ago. The Atlanta days. <laughs> yeah, we're those uh, uh, Atlanta guys that eventually made our way to Nashville. You came up here right. in, what, 1998? But we met in 1994 at a, at a country music huge country music venue there cowboys they said 3000 seat venue largest venue east of the mississippi at the time i guess it was i think that's how they build that a lot of major artists came through there every friday would be a national act you know we were the house band so we would we would open up for national acts at the time at restless heart diamond rio um, I can go back. Lee Trevino, Emilio, Jeffrey uh, Steele, Boy Howdy. Yeah, uh, your, your artist Darren Norwood. Uh, yeah, just I mean, you know, we just I just met Charlie Daniels. You know, Willie Nelson. Yeah, I met so many people. Met so many people, and um, what a great eye? experience. Did you have your eye on Nashville at the time you were working there? What? Yeah, as a matter of fact, Atlanta was just a just a, kind of a stop on the way to Nashville is kind of how that worked out. Um, I was back in, um, I'm originally from Ohio and Southern Ohio. And um, there was a recording school there called the recording workshop. And I, I went to this, the, the, the school when I was 16 years old, the owner's name was uh, uh, Joe uh, Waters. And, and he invited me down to the studio again like when i was 16 i walked in they had these big yuri studio monitors and he was playing some music and it just like oh wow this is like this is probably the coolest thing i've ever seen in my life as a recording studio this had been good grief william i 74 or 75 not not to date myself but you know i've i've got about three hundred thousand miles on me right now i think something like that definitely over two hundred thousand miles but uh um, so anyway, so Joe, the recording workshop, um, um, 
he knew my family and um, kind of he ended up kind of taking me under his his wing and um, he put me through the school. I, I was I was he he was a national act for a while. Joe was, and we had this is like when Kenny Rogers was hot on the charts in the mid '80s, you know. Um, and I was his drummer. I was his touring drummer, and um, I also played on his, his uh, sessions, his, his demos. I didn't cut his records because he would bring in people like James Stroud and Jerry Carrigan and these awesome drummers. I would do the demo, and then Stroud would come in and play. Um, the actual record, and I would go, well, he's playing kind of the, basically the same thing I did, but it sure sounds a lot better than what I was doing. You know, you kind of start well, figuring out. Well, you were out. learning. You were a young man, yeah, right? Joe Waters, we, he was a national artist, and we were, we were, you know, we were on the Billboard charts. We got into the 40s, you know, uh, with that stuff. But I would do the demos, and then he'd bring, this is in Ohio, he would bring the, the Nashville guys up, um, Jerry Kerrigan, who's rest in peace, you know, Stroud, and, um, Bob Ray and Bobby Ogden and oh my god freaking monsters I had no idea who these guys were and I would just hang out in the sessions and watch these guys it was incredible but anyway so um uh, uh Joe decided he's gonna come off the road and um I, I remember cutting a dem I was cutting a demos for him one day uh behind the drum kit and he gets one to talk back and Mike and says hey Tony how would you like to learn how to to uh run all this equipment <laughs> you know to go he so he basically i said well of course and he put me through a school uh, i once i uh, graduated from his school he gave me a job teaching audio there as an instructor um very um you know, uh, young young age 23 something like that teaching audio and uh, my wife worked what was it she wasn't my wife then but nancy cheney worked there at the time and i met nancy who became my wife and uh we're now 38 years into a marriage so but anyway um kind of the the drumming versus the audio thing i remember sitting in audio classes and thinking man learning all this gear is really going to cut into my my drumming time <laughs> you know uh, i should be i should be practicing rudiments or uh, you know and um um but something in me just kind of drove me towards, you know, you need to learn this. You know, you need to learn, you need to learn this audio and just kind of put the drums on the back burner. But anyway, so, uh, I mean, I was at the workshop for, for, for no idea years. that that would become your day job. No idea, man. <laughs> No idea. I say um, that jokingly. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, 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 you were yeah. working. You were going to school for a day gig. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, I actually, I, I had a day gig working at a nuclear enrichment plant as a draftsman. And I kept that day gig so that I could play drums at night. It was kind of one of those, you know, work all day, play all night kind of a things. And, um, uh, but anyway, so I was, I was working at the, at this uh, uh, atomic enrichment plant plant when I was when when I hooked up with Joe playing drums for Joe anyway so eventually uh, uh, the plant moved in different directions I took an early retirement at 23 and uh, went to audio school so um, so anyway so you know we, we teach audio five it was, it was it, the program is still there the recording workshop is still there it's a great program what a foundation I, I pull from it a lot what I learned there are miking techniques and how to run gear and consoles and signal flow. And I mean, it's just, it, 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 it's, it was, it, it's, it's my Bible of audio. It's my foundation it's, it's that, that the house sits on. So, but, um, so over the years, you know, we, we, we would teach five days a week and it was a, a, a seven week program, seven times a year. So it was pretty intense to do that back to back like that. But they allowed the engineers on the weekends with the instructors to be engineers on the weekends. So we would use the studio as clients, client time. So I decided then about 91 that I was going to go after the brass ring. I was going to put a band together um, as a drummer. And at this point in time, I've worked for music agencies and I understood contracts and understood how to put put together a bio and uh, a bit about touring and and I just felt I was pretty well rounded in um, understanding the, the business so I handpicked some musicians around there I got a singer out of Charleston West Virginia a guitar player out of Columbus Ohio bass player out of Dayton um, and put a band together and did a demo and I started shopping the demo uh, what was the uh, band called the bands called Hank Law we I shopped it and it, uh, there was a, a gentleman, uh, Bill Haverson is his name, and he would was a guest lecturer at the recording workshop and and Bill, 
Some of you may have heard that name. Bill was the Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, Cream. I mean, the guy, he was living in Nashville at the time and, and he was interested in the project. So we brought him up from Nashville. He recorded some other demos on us and he started shopping Hank Law Project, he started shopping it around Nashville and, and sending us songs. Um, what, 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 one of the songs, that, um, kind of a, kind of a funny story. And I will, I, I will get back to the topic of, of Atlanta. Um, one of the songs that Bill found for us was a song called High Tech Redneck. Okay, so we recorded High Tech Redneck at the, at the studio. I was working out there at the recording workshop on the, you know, on the weekends when we had our, our, our available time to do that. And we were playing it. We, were, we had a house job locally there, and we were playing this song out live, High Tech Redneck. And people were loving it and were like, man, we have got the song. This is the song that's going to start Hank Law off onto the road you know and uh, and unfortunately there was no spotify oh my god apple no. you couldn't be an artist you couldn't put it out yourself and have oh, it uh-uh. streaming you had to no you were you were at the mercy of you a, had to of print a cds label. and sell them yeah you, you you could be a regional act or you know you 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 were signed to a label when the label had all the distribution you didn't you couldn't distribute something on on your own unless you did it by mail Sure. <laughs> we didn't even, you know, did, I mean, internet was kind of just starting to come around. I mean, good grief. I remember getting my first Macintosh at, at, in 1991, you know, so the first oh, Mac yeah. was just out internet was by a couple just of years. A, something you had to log into a university to get on. Yeah, of course, you know, I, I you know, I, I work with a young artist now and around a lot of the young musicians. And they don't want to hear all this stuff, you know. You had to walk to school uphill both ways in the snow stuff, you know. But 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 that that's the point of it is is you know you it, it was harder to promote yourselves, you know. So anyway, so we you know we were, our local following was listen this song High Tech Redneck, and they're like we love this song, we record it, and we're sh- and, and 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 Bill Harrison is shopping us uh, with it around Nashville, and and Bill calls us one day one day calls me. Um, and uh, says you guys have to stop record, stop playing that song, um, because it, there's an artist in town. His name's George Jones, and and George Jones is going to record and release that song. Not only is he going to release that song, but that's going to be the title of his next record, High Tech Redneck. And so, you, it, it, it's it's deflating, man. But. You know, you pull yourself up by the bootstraps and you keep finding other tunes. You know, we, we had some great songs, you know, writers in town here, Gary Burr and people like that. But but the the, the lead singer in the band at that time, um, Ben Brook Belcher, uh, wrote a lot of our songs. So we had a lot of our own material. So, uh, so this is getting to Atlanta, I swear. So anyway, so I put this band together to get the brass ring. Um, you know, and, and being a drummer, if you, any drummers are listening out there, you know, you don't get the songwriter credits. You, you don't, you know, kind of a thing. So, uh, you know, I just figured putting a band together would get me a slice of the pie. Okay. I call it greed or whatever. I just call it being smart. That's business <laughs> acumen. <laughs> it's, it's, it certainly is, William. So, all right. So then we go on the road with this thing. Um, um, so, you know, I buy a van. Uh, buy a trailer, um, start booking through these uh, 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 East Coast Entertainment and all these agents, uh, Mike Smartack and all these people who who book. Uh, I mean, at this time, again, you you have to think about what was happening then. Line dancing, two-stepping. You, you could make a living touring, playing these line dance uh, country venues four or five nights a week you make a living doing this yeah this was at the uh the garth brooks explosion you know there was Man, right there. the urban cowboy explosion of the right early there. 80s and then the 90s it was the garth explosion exactly. and you are right in the middle of that it's exactly when that happened um you know and i remember i remember at that time a friend of mine who was in nashville jim mckell who's a fabulous engineer for the judds and uh, Kenny Rogers and just just an incredible mentor um, sent me a record. It told me, told me, man, you need to go check that. I was in Ohio then. You, you need to go check out this CD. It was you know, when, again CDs were just kind of happening from cassettes and it, you know called Restless Heart. You need to check this stuff out. I'm like, okay, man. And um, so th- this is when I was just getting into the studio. 
thing. And, and so I went and immediately picked up this Restless Heart CD and listened to it. And, and it was like, you got to be kidding me. We can do this. You can do this in Nashville now. You can make records like this. It was a rock and roll record, but what wow, the harmonies and it, just the production of it just... I just really, for me, it just didn't get any better than that. So it so it inspires you even more, you know, to get to Nashville where 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 everything is happening. Even though you know it, they're in Southern Ohio, believe it or not, we we were exposed to a, a lot of really major talent, you know, that come through there. Um, but still, you, I, I always had bigger dreams, you know. I I, 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 you know, I just wanted to see what was across the bridge, what was out there. So anyway, so that that record inspired me. So anyway, the Hank Law is out touring, and um, Bill shopping us at the same time. Bill Howerson shopping us in Nashville at the same time. One of our stops on our circuit, as you did the circuit, you know up to Minnesota, down to Wilmington, North Carolina, and all points in between. Good grief. I can't believe we put those kind of miles in that van. But um, uh, one of our stops was a club in Atlanta called Miss Kitty's. And um, Miss Kitty's uh, in Marietta. Right yeah. on, brother. So we that was one of our stops. And um, Danny Shirley, the Confederate Railroad, had just got his deal out of Miss Kitty's. He was the house band there. Uh, prior to Danny getting his record deal there, Travis Trent got his record deal there. And some of you, I mean, this is going back in history. He, uh, Travis did his uh, country club video out of, out of Miss Kitty's. But Travis was the house band, got his deal. Um, Danny got his deal. We were on the circuit, and um, they were looking for another house band, you know. And um, we were all still living in Ohio. And... Um, it, it was a leap of faith, man. Um, so the the you know talking to the produ- our producer and things like that, it put us that much closer to Nashville. So that way we we could be in Atlanta, a bigger city, obviously. We could do showcases all the time out of the venue. Not a bad place to land. Well, it made sense, you know. So we pull we uprooted our families. I had a son at the time, was a baby, and a couple of years old. Um, we all moved to Atlanta. <laughs> oh my God! Anyway, that's a whole other. I could we could we could talk about that for days. That whole trip to Atlanta. You know, I, I come from a, a, a little town of twenty thousand people into a city of almost four million, and uh, wow, it was uh, it was quite a shock for Nancy and and, my, and myself. Um, but what an education! So anyway, so Hank Law took the house job at, at Miss Kitty's, and we. Um, did just that we had label people coming out of nashville management people coming out of nashville bill would set all this up uh they would come down uh and we would do showcases and then we played there five this five nights a week i mean it was it was it was a job man i mean you know it was it was a job but you know we we could play our original material there at miss kitty's um i mean everybody knew it 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 was miss kitty's it was buckboard at the time and then uh uh, up in kennesaw was crystal chandelier so these were all three of your happening venues mark wills came out of the buckboard you know um uh uh, darren norwood darren you're you're that you wrote your bad dog no biscuit for is is awesome man that came out of there anyway it, it, it was it was it was hard it was a lot of work but now I look back at it. Wow, what what, a, what an experience, you know, and and, and the talent uh, in the country music um, um, business there at that time. We had no idea the amount of talent. Um, you know, Randy Starles, who played Steel for oh. us, w- went on to be with um, yeah Montgomery Gentry and 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 um, and J- Jimmy Cox the. Uh, went on to play with that. I mean, just so many, so many, many talented musicians. Yeah, you said yeah. Jimmy Cox. Jimmy, and what's Jimmy go? You don't go by Cox anymore. He's he's still with Montgomery. Anyway, um, let, let's let's back up to Miss Kitty. So we had label people coming all the time, and as a matter of fact, we the last showcase I remember doing their Decca Records came, you know, and, and, and I don't know how much name dropping we can do here, but uh, Frank Liddell was um, 
and Mark Wright were pretty much that label at the time. And um, Frank really liked the band. He really liked our band, Hank Law. And it, it was about to happen. It, it, I, it was, I think it was finally going to happen for us, you know, all this hard work on my gut and in decafolds, you know. So there you go, the business boy, and great. So then um, they end up finding their, they end up finding Frank and, and Mark end up finding their, their artist to sign, which was Leanne Womack. You know, so that was that was that time. As a matter of fact, Leanne and Frank are husband and wife. Isn't that correct? I believe, you know, um, but anyway, so they put all of their time and efforts into Leanne and, and Hank Law just kind of started crumbling a little bit. And in, in, in the meantime, um, up the road was the Crystal Chandelier. At that time, uh, the guy who was running Monders there, who used to be the manager at Miss Kitty's is named Jimmy Buster. And. Uh, uh, Jimmy has since passed on. What a, what a sweetheart guy. He was guy, a great you know. guy. Yeah. God, I loved him to death. You know, you th- think back about your career. They're, they're, you know, you need people to, to help you and certain people um, kind of give you a boost. Jimmy was one of those people. You know, Joe yes. Waters was one of those people for me that, that just believed in me and kind of pushed you along and just gave you breaks, you know. R.K., Randy, you know, he probably don't realize this. We're he, talking about Randy Brown, yeah, otherwise man. R.K. Brown. R.K., he gave me, he, he, he really, he believed in me. Um, so anyway, so Jimmy, th- they were getting, re- the house band over there at the, at the Chandelier was getting ready to disband, and they were looking for another drummer. And I, I just felt that the Hank Law thing wasn't, it was just losing all of his traction. I didn't feel that that everybody was into it like I was uh, and um, all the efforts, you know, and all that. But anyway, so I, I, I auditioned for, um, while well, I was still playing at Miss Kitty's, I auditioned for uh, the house drummer at the Chandelier, which was being bought out by Cowboys. Um, and I got the gig, you know, and I went ahead and, I, I mean, I had the gig when I was still playing at Cowboys and I was still playing at Miss Kitty's. But anyway, so I moved over there and... Um, that's when I met you uh, at, at at that time um, in in Randy uh, Brown. R.K. R- Brown was the bass player and the uh, band leader. And a, a couple of weeks past that, then um, Cowboys, which is a basically a chain at the time, they had a venue in uh, Dallas, San Antonio, Houston, and uh, they they bought the uh, Atlanta venue. So Atlanta was their fourth venue and um man we man we had a good band man that was a good band and we 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 tried to promote some of the artists within um um uh, yeah tell us some of the members of that band was it todd clayton was in that band see so rk brown was in that randy sarles was in that band um rob tyler uh was in that band darren robbins was darren robbins was in the band yes singer uh, oh, uh, Benny Boynton, yeah. keyboards. Um, Glenn, what was Glenn's last name? Also played with um, uh, t- t- uh, Pam Tillis. Uh, A lot of great players. Man, so much talent. So much talent there. And, and, and you know, I, I, I realized how good of a drummer I wasn't. <laughs> I really, you're I really being, uh, did. You're being humble, but. Uh, oh, man, I tell you, I mean, I just like, wow, how did I end up here, you know? I mean, the the the, the Cowboys job for a, a musician around Atlanta, um, it was probably the number one house gig. I mean, you know, let's, let's face it. it. It was it was five days a week. It paid good. I mean, you, you opened up for a national act every every week. It was it was the gig to have, man. And a little boy from Southern Ohio with this big gig in Atlanta, you know, um, it, 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 was, it was a lot of pressure because there was a lot of people that wanted that job. There were a lot of drummers that wanted that job, you know, like, you know, like how the, how the business is. But anyway, so back to RK, um, has sight issues, you know, seeing impaired. Um, it, it, he was the band leader and it was a big stage, you know. So he, you know, I was upstage center and he was uh, d- downstage left. And, and I, have, I had always, um, uh, w- the relationship with, with a drummer and a bass player was like the bass player, wash your foot, you know, kind of a thing. And, and, 
and they basically would follow your foot. But that, that's not the way that worked with RK. That's not the way that worked because he couldn't see your foot. So you needed to land, your foot needed to land on that note. If it wasn't landing on that note, we'd go back in the break room between sets and he would just rip my butt, man. He would rip my butt. And I used to get so mad at him. I get so mad at him. But he was doing me a favor. You know, he was doing me a big favor uh, uh, of pointing out some of the uh, inconsistencies in my playing. You know, I, of course, I've been recording. He was forever. taking you to the next level. Dude, I'm telling you, I'd yeah. never really been around anybody like that before. That Well, you have to let the audience know that RK had already toured. By the time he was 17, 18 years old, he was touring with Curtis Mayfield. Oh, my God. And he was one of the A team guys in the city of Atlanta. He was playing on records with Benny King and and lots of other artists. So he came from a Yeah. Yeah, he was musically gifted from day one and you know, he was probably without a doubt, next to Allison Prestwood, probably the best bass player in Atlanta. And a funky oh, cat. Doubt, man. He's taught he's taught a lot of people more than just drummers. He's taught me a lot too about playing and keeping it in the pocket. But go ahead. So R.K. is too. schooling you. Yes, he's a wonderful human being. Um, I, you know, I think, again, he's one of those, you know, he just he just believed in me. He believed that I I could do it, you know, uh, that that I could be that drummer, you know. And, and I think that he, he liked me as a person, which, you know, there's that hang factor, you know. It's, it's one thing to be a really great musician, but, um, you, you know, you gotta, you got to be fun, a fun hang. Um, sometimes I'm kind of an intense hang, you know what I mean? But but a good heart anyway, right? Good. Person. I would absolutely agree. <laughs> and I know that RK provided that cocoon for you there. As yeah. band leader, he protected you and gave you time to develop. You he know, did man, and 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 grow into what he knew you could be. Yeah. So. Oh, there's no question about it. I mean, there's just no. He's probably the he. I would say he had the most impact on me as a musician than anybody in my entire career. I mean, it's with without a doubt. I mean, with without a doubt. And so, at so at the time, so we're we're, we're at Cowboys we've got a killer killer band, and we we basically had to learn about five songs a week off the. We, we were a sweating jukebox, you know. Um, we had to know all the, the current Joe Diffie songs. We had to know all the current Restless Heart songs and all the current, you know. Little music. Texas, Lone Star, the whole, yeah. All that stuff at the time. We didn't realize how good that music was, you know what I mean? In the 90s. We had no idea. We had no, we were just doing our thing. We had no idea how much we were going to miss it. Oh, my God. It's just such good music I, now. Looking back at it, I mean. You know, out doing shows now, these big festivals, you know, the younger generation of people, and that's what they listen to. They know all the lyrics to those 90s songs. They listen to the 90s country. It's crazy to see how popular it still is. It's really crazy. So back to um, back to Cowboys. So, you know, we would learn five songs a week off of Billboard. And I'm like, you probably think, well, five songs, that isn't too bad. Well, you know, there's four weeks in a month, sometimes five, right? Um, so that's 20 or 25 songs. So they would pick, sometimes they would pick songs for us to learn. And then we would do, but that when, every Wednesday was ladies night, it would be packed with these baseball every, players and everybody came because it was just, oh, yeah. it was just it was so big. many gorgeous yeah. people. I mean, just everybody was just, it was just beautiful people, you know? Um, and, and you had that DJ on the breaks. You were playing, DJ. pumping in the dance stuff, whatever. Well, you know, dance dance mixes just started then. Yeah. The whole remix thing. Yes. The whole remix thing had just begun. So DJs were kind of like, because, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I don't want to offend any DJs, you know, but when I was growing up, if you were a DJ, you were kind of a nerd. You know, uh, a musician was kind of the cool thing. Now it's like, being a DJ is a cool thing, and the musicians. They are rock stars. <laughs> they have their own agents. They have agents and touring uh, management, yeah. and uh, yeah, yeah. So anyway, there's that. So um, then, so like for example, I'll go back to the songs, learning all those songs. So you know, like on a Wednesday night, we would try out the new song off the Billboard charts, and the next day we would come in to practice, and the and the the club owner would go, "Hey, that song's not working." You know, you guys played that last night. Nobody got on the dance floor. That song's not working. So that song's dropped, you know, but it, but it's con constant, just constant. Um, 
you know, you, you, you learn to, you learn how to make charts. I, I think I had my, around my, my rack and my drum kit, I, I had probably 20 charts posted at one at one time. And you're having to count these stuff. tempos off tempos. too. You got to have the right. tempos and count it off. You got to at least know kind of the beginning, the middle and the end. It always helps. Yeah. <laughs> you know. um, so, so, so then there was a point to this and the point to it is, is, you know, back to RK, the point to it is that, that I, I had a son. Uh, I still, of course, still do and married and uh, Nancy and, and, um, um, she, Nancy would work during the the day at, at a regular day gig, and I would be Mr. Mom at the house. And you know, of course, Anton would have school and things like that. But but um, I, I, I again, everybody wanted this gig. A lot of drummers wanted this this gig. So you you had to keep your chops up. So I needed to practice. You you know, besides practicing songs, you needed to practice on my drumming. And um, because I wanted to keep the job and Randy's, you know, was RK was, um, you know, pressuring me day in and day out about about my accuracy. And so uh, I was determined I was going to get better and I came up with a practice routine and, and it had to be a practice routine where it could be quick, efficient, get in what I needed to get d done quickly because um, I had to cook dinner. <laughs> you know, I had to go get pick Anton up off the school bus or or whatever. It wasn't like now I got to ask you. I'm sorry yeah, to okay. inject here, yeah. Anton. Yeah, Anton. Named after Fig. Yeah. Okay. And then and then had to and throw then that Anth in there. Anthony. I didn't you're, want to name Tony, him Anthony. You're right. Yeah, Tony so Anthony Anton. is my name. So okay, it's kind of so, like Anton. So Anton. Anton's an influence. He was one of your. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, yeah. I didn't right. mean to digress. Oh, there, yeah, but Go ahead. Yeah. Back to uh, funny. Creating. A lot of people don't put that together. Yeah. It's a really common. It's a really common name, uh, yeah. Anton. Is well, I just had to. I get, so, you know, your drummer kind of had thing. to ask. Anton's a whole another. Anton's a whole another story. Uh, yeah. Vanderbilt, MIT. It's just, anyway, that's a whole another story. But anyway, so came up with this practice routine, and and it was thirteen essential rudiments, and then these drum parts that were uh, uh, jazz swing and slow jazz and uh, Latin stuff and rock stuff and, and all these different exercises I pulled from from drum books and 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 got it recorded recorded them uh, to a CD and I have the notation and I would sit down and and with it again it's kind of inspired by at the time was these 60 minute workout videos you know where you get in and do this this high intense exercise stuff in 60 minutes and so I came up with a drum book I was telling you a little bit about it before we started doing this uh, podcast this drum book this is 94. So I started this drum book in 94. And, and what year is this? <laughs> 2020 Coming up on, yeah. I still have it. And, and I want, I, I got to release it. I, I got to get this drum book out. And, and I, I think that it has. It, well, the content doesn't change. The exercises no. don't change. I mean, it's still fundamentally a great workout for drummers. Yeah, I, I I I believe in that, and and um, I it, it's just one of those things, uh, William, where it, it for me it's it's got to be perfect before I put it out there. But you know, it, it's never going to be perfect. The the book is never going to be perfect. So I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to get this drum book out. So anyway, it, what I was able to do then was during <laughs> during the day, sixty minutes, ninety minutes practice pretty much every day. And then go play five nights a week over at Cowboys, and I got good. <laughs> I got good. I kept the gig, you know. And so that is kind of that story there in in Atlanta, except for the ending. And the ending was that Cowboys closed down their Dallas club, and they had a house band there, and they offered the house band musicians well, a job yeah. but that job was in atlanta yeah. okay so if whoever whoever raised their hand that wanted to relocate to atlanta the people who were in atlanta those jobs would have to be vacated so the drummer decides to come up and the um keyboard player decides to come up and the bass player decides to come up so Randy RK, Benny Boynton, the keyboard player, and myself were all fired. 
from the gig. And, um, you know, it, 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 business isn't, it isn't always fair. You know, Randy was uh, But in fairness, though, it ran its course. And it brought you to where you are today. I think so. Well, you look yeah. at the time; you don't see that. God bless the broken road, right? I mean, you know, because yeah. you man. have a very successful career here in Nashville yeah. as a front of house engineer, yeah. as a studio recording engineer, as yeah. a tour manager. So all that knowledge you gathered in the Atlanta days, you were able to bring to Nashville. Yeah. What nineteen ninety eight, somewhere around then. So not only do you have your drumming skills, mm-hmm. do you ever get to use those anymore? Because that's not your career now. Your career mm-hmm. is a studio engineer, touring manager, touring engineer, front mm-hmm. of house. So, well, you know the the discipline that that I learned um, th- through my drumming there, especially um, at Cowboys, ha- has has really um, brought a lot of discipline into my recordings as an engineer um in that i i know where the pocket is <laughs> you know i i i'm I'm, re- I'm really good at editing drums i'm i'm good at pocketing drums um meter j- j- just feeling the the the, the, the rhythm of, so yeah i mean it, it was it was it was major it was just a a a, a, a major education um for, for me well let's talk about times. that now because you're in nashville now it's uh 2022 almost 2023 yeah you have worked with an impressive list of clients i can't name them all we, we put just a few yeah. of them in the intro you've worked with vince gill or earl thomas Conley, ronnie mm-hmm. Millsap, exile yeah. you've yeah. had a long career with exile about seven years yeah and still work with them you're no longer front of house with with them or tour manager, but you you're still recording tracks for their their new album. Yeah. You're currently on tour uh, as front of house engineer with LV Shane, who was an American Idol contestant a few years ago, who has since come to Nashville from Kentucky. Is touring now. He had a had a hit called I think My Boy. My Boy. Yeah, great song. So you're currently with LV. Yeah. You got a young artist, super talented. What's that like going out and playing these shows? He's been opening for like Brooks and Dunn and other people, um, and you're doing his front of house. Tell me about Elvi and your relationship with him. Well, it's um, you know again, like I say, I got over two hundred thousand miles on me, but it's one of those. It's it's a, a thing in my career where I wanted to get involved in a startup company. It's, it's okay. kind of like a startup company because it's a brand new artist, you know, new management label. I mean, it's you know, it's they're they're launching a new artist, and, and and boy, talk about another education, right? I mean, watching this um, and working with management and and the label. So I, I guess that that I guess that's that's kind of the the, the besides I I, I lo- love Alvy as a, as a person he's a good he's a good dude man I I just, I just been have I've really been fortunate to um, work with some just not only great musicians but just good people you know just good 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 hearted good hearted uh, people and and I you know I I share a lot of. Uh, uh, what LV believes as, as a person and, and what it takes to be to be a good person in in life, I share a lot of that, you know. So uh, how how I met LV was I um, would go to um, Lexington, Kentucky, and uh, do some of like the premier mixing uh, uh, gigs for uh, an audio production company out of Kentucky, Kentucky called Pro Audio Video. And one of the, the shows uh, that I mixed was the um, Kentucky Music Hall of Fame inductions that they would do. And, and boy, there's a whole nother, we talk about the, the oh, sure. in, incredible musicians in Georgia. I mean, let's talk about the musicians in Kentucky. Man, I mean, shit. Well, the first two that come to mind for me are guys that, you know, I know like Ricky Skaggs and, yeah. you know, the late Keith Whitley and... You know, there's just a ton of folks that have come from Kentucky. Do you know the Backstreet Boys are from Kentucky? I did not know that. We know now. I bet a lot of listeners them, didn't know two that Two of them either. or three of them were from there. That? Kentucky Boys. So um, I was mixing this show, The um, who was being inducted. Of course, Exiles in the Kentucky Music Hall of Fame, you know, so I've done their show there. But this was, this was a different one. This was uh, Montgomery Gentry was being inducted and the Backstreet Boys was being inducted that night. And um, um, 
um, they also recognized industry people. Uh, a guy named Clarence Spalding was being inducted that night. Clarence is like the number one manager in town here with Maverick uh, Management. So there's, and I'll tie that in later. Pretty, pretty funny. Well, anyway, so the um, there's this boy. He he was he was helping run cables and things like that um, mm-hmm. for the the sound company, and it was Elvi, you know. And he was just he he was a roadie, and uh, we talked all night, man. We talked. He was back at front of house, and we just talked about the business. And he wanted to get to Nashville. He wanted to learn how to do audio. And um, at the time, I was the director. Is this post American Idol? Yes. No. It's, this is yeah. This is pre, this pre-American. Is pre-American. Not, not post-American. He's Island. he's just this long-haired kid. All right. Kentucky, West, Western Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky boy. Um, that's wanting to get into the business, and he thinks he wants to, to get into production. Yeah. And so we're talking. We're talking. We're talking. I go, and I was at the time. Um, the, I was the director of uh, Blackbird Academy which is a, an audio school here, um, John McBride, Martina McBride Audio School. And um, and I was, it, it, it was the live audio program at Blackbirds right across from Claire Global. And so, um, you know, I just tell Elvie, well, if you really want to, you really want to learn how to do production, you come to my school, you come to, you know, Blackbird. And uh, it's a great program. You'll get an intern at Claire and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so... Um, we just hit it off. I, 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 I thought we I really felt that we hit, we hit it off. And um, he, I guess he did tour the school, uh, kind of lost track of him there for a while. And then I, then I was back up working for that same company at um, Keeneland um, um, Horse Track. And I was mixing the uh, Lexington Philharmonic Symphony, you know, and... Uh, and here that's comes, a lot of microphones, isn't it? Or was I, I th- it? More I think of we a... had about sixty mics that. I think we had about yeah. sixty mics that night. So anyway, here what comes, a challenge! Oh, I, never, I, could... I love it. Good. Yeah, man, they, they, in a great symphony too there in Kentucky. Um, so here comes Elvie, um, and he's going to help you know with some run some mic cables and things like that. And he says, "Hey, man, I I got a song out." I got a song out and it's got 30 million hits on Facebook right now. And I'm like, yeah, sure, sure, sure you do, kid. Well, you grab me a couple yeah. extra jumper cables, you know, yeah. XLR jumpers <laughs> or something. I'm trying to patch in this effect device or whatever. But, uh, but, 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 but man, what, what just, what just, he, he just has one of those, those personalities that just, that he pulls you in. You know, Charismatic. You in. And, oh man. Yeah. And, and, and he says, "No, man, I really, I really do this song. My boy is it's going viral," and um, he was right. So, <laughs> so then um, it, it wasn't too long ago. I see he's on American Idol, you know, and 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 I I, I, I was doing, um, I, have, I have a production company too, you know, line array and lighting and things like that, and I was doing um, uh, like a pre-party production. Um, up in uh, Marion, Illinois, uh, at the, the minor league baseball diamond there. I think Brantley Gilbert was headlining the main stage, and I was doing the um, 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 pre-party stage with my PA. And um, and I see that LV Shane's on the bill there with Brantley Gilbert, Montgomery Gentry, LV. Brantley Gilbert is on this bill, and um, does I've, he know you're doing front of house for this? He doesn't know I'm there, and um, so I take a picture of it, and I I think I messaged him on Facebook or something like that, and I said, "Hey, dude, check you out, man, on the big screen here." You know, uh, <laughs> it's kind of up from the bowl that it's sure, a, it's yeah, a baseball diamond. I'm kind of up in the bowl, and I'm kind of sh- taking a picture off my phone, and so uh, I so I, I send Alvy I send Alvy this picture. He goes, "You here, man?" I said, yeah, dude. I said, I just, it's awesome, man. Check you out. I mean, you know, you were, you were running cables a couple of years ago, you, you know, and tell me you had a song going viral and here you're on the, on the, on the big stage. And I, and, and I told him, I said, I mean, if you ever need a front of house guy, cause you know, the way, the way this works is that when a young artist goes out, they can't really afford a big band or they can't afford their own production team. Um, um, it, that comes later, you know, when the money comes. And I said, man, I'd, I'll, I'll, I'll throw my hat in the ring. You know, if you need somebody to go out and mix, 
I threw my hat in the ring. And so anyway, he, he hooks up. Let's, let's back up here. So Clarence Spalding was being inducted into the Kentucky Music Hall of Fame the first night I met Elvie. Okay. So uh, Clarence is the number one manager pro- probably in town. In my book, he is. I mean, he handles Reba. He handles Brooks and Dunn, Darius, Darius Rucker. Um, I mean, hit the company now. The, I mean, Red Hot Chili Peppers. I mean, it's just massive. So Clarence was being inducted in the Country Music Hall of Fame the night I met LV. And so after LV and I kind of start hooking up here to where we're going to go out and do some shows, he's shopping for management. He's shopping for a label. He goes, man, I, I'm talking to, I was talking to Clarence Spalding about managing me. And I go, <laughs> I go, dude, do you know we met when Clarence was being inducted? And in? so anyway, Clarence is, is Alvy's manager. Uh, I, I just thought that was kind of, kind of wild, wild story that. And so, but anyway, I, I've been out with, um, I've been out with, with Alvy, um, since 21, uh, you know, 2021, um, he's getting some good traction. He, he's on Broken Bow, uh, records, Jason Aldean, uh, Lanny Wilson, Jelly Roll. I mean, you know, Broken yeah. Bow is, is his is his label, and of course, you know, he has some awesome management. And we did one of our biggest tours. We starting out was twenty one, right back from the pandemic, was the Brooks and Dunn reboot tour, and we were on that with Travis Tritt. Yes, <laughs> with Travis Tritt uh, and seeing Wendell Cox. You know, he used to play music with Wendell down in right. Atlanta. You know. Um, guitar player. For Wendell's Travis. been with him forever oh, man. since the beginning. Yeah, really, Wendell too is yeah. a whole another, a whole another great human being right there. Um, so anyway, so we, you know, we did we did that reboot tour um, uh, in twenty one with great experience for these guys. And he's got a really young band, and I don't know if they realized th- that they were on this stage. <laughs> you know, not too. Uh, <laughs> I got to ask this question. I don't man. You're on tour buses with these kids. What's that like? Oh yeah, at our age, yeah, be on a bus running the road with a bunch of twenty somethings. Or I'm, I'm the first one to bed, and the fir- I'm the yeah. first one to bed, and the first one up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're they're up all night. You know, sure. Alvi Alvi does a lot of writing in the back of the bus. He'll bring a lot of songwriters out with him, and my bunk is the furthest one back in the middle, so my head is mm-hmm. facing the um, the the back lounge there, so I get to hear new songs all night. Um, being recorded back in the back of the bus but 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 there it, it, the energy is awesome the energy is awesome you know um keeping you youthful yeah i think so good i think you so. look great man oh I thanks man dude you can't see this but he looks great um so yeah it's it's yeah it, they're, they're young you know um i mean it's the first you know you hop on the bus and it's, it's the first time most of them have ever been on a bus you, you know things like you know which way you actually sleep and and uh, just just the, the bus living you know never really experienced it before so they call me Uncle Tony. I was going to get Tony to that. I wonder if yeah. you had a nickname. You're sort of the uh, the resident mentor elder. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, they you got a lot of experience. I want to talk about Exile. You invited me in. Thank you. I had a great time watching Exile record their new album. You worked for them for seven years as front of house engineer, but you have a special relationship with that band that goes back uh, a bit. Tell me about that. And uh, they're recording a new album for uh, 2023 release, and you're doing some of the engineering on that. What's that Mm -hmm. like? Well, we're, 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 we're here. We're here at my, my place. It's just, I'm I'm outside in Nashville, North Nashville. And um, um, I, I have a rehearsal room and a, and a studio here. Um, and um, it basically is a converted garage. Um, th- that oddly enough, people just really love to come to record here. I you would know. call it Abbey Road Gallatin <laughs> because you have to step down into the studio. You come up to the yeah. uh, control room and you got to walk step down. down to the basement. So the Abbey room. Road Gallatin. That's All funny, right, so, man. So I, I, you know, I cameraed up. You can, you can. Yeah, I, my my control room is in my bedroom in in. Um, you know, I, I hired an IT guy to kind of w- do all the wiring and things like that. So basically, I have a TV there and a camera out in the in the main room in the garage um, where I can watch the band. You know, and uh, they all run their mixes off an of iPad. And but but I I, th- I think 
And also this other artist I work with, Jimmy Bowen, he records here a lot, that researches the TV show here a lot. And I, I think maybe, I don't really, I haven't really asked the musicians what they like about it so much, but I think mainly because it's not like they're in a studio and they look in the control room and they see the doctor in there, you know, the, 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 the crazy guys with the lab coats and all the gear and blah, blah, blah. You don't, you don't see the engineer. They're, they're, they're basically just, they're kind of, they're re in a rehearsal setting, but you're recording them. You, you know what I'm saying? So it's not like this sterile environment that a studio can be sometimes, you know, we all try to, the, the studio, you try to create this energy and this kind of this live vibe. And sometimes it's really, it's really tough when you're under the microscope of a... Well, with the exception of the garage doors, you wouldn't even know you're in a garage. Once you're in it. The lighting is fantastic the yeah. rugs the you know the vibe is great you know it's a i did a, I did me and my a buddy we we did we did all that I, you know i i didn't really like shoot the room and create and and and, and do uh acoustician stuff where this treatment needs to be here and that treatment needs to be there it's just all kind of like off the cuff like i know what this is i know if i put this here it'll absorb these things and this will will keep bass frequencies from standing up and i just kind of went for it went to lows and started buying stuff you know um and created this this, this environment it's, but but um you know everybody kind of you know like you were you were we were talking kind of off the, the record there that it, it, you know the, it, the exile there they they come in as a live band and it's their material they play on their their own uh records and uh they track as a band um it's uh you know as far as recording goes these days lots of times it's it's everybody is tracking individually where um you know somebody like an rk might create a a click track and a keyboard part and a bass part and he'll then he'll e Dropbox that or whatever to somebody who puts a drum track on it, and then that person, you know, you get that back, and then you send it to somebody else that puts a, a guitar break on it. But it, it, you know, the human interaction, of course, you know, it, probably COVID had a lot to do with that. But I think it was kind of hanging that direction anyway, for, from what I've seen over over the years. But but with with Exile, it, it's it's a real band. They're uh, making records. Thing. They are, man. It's awesome. They're playing their parts. They're they're playing not you know traditionally in Nashville. You've you've got an A list of session players yeah. that will come in. They'll track live. Yeah. But they're you know but this is a band recording as a band. A lot of people don't realize that. They just presume that everybody plays on their own records. But Exile right. actually is playing on their own records, and you've the created secret, an environment. The big lie. No. Dude, they're playing to a click track and locking it down, throwing it down, real drums, real yeah. bass in real time. You know, it's, yeah. it was fun to watch. Yeah. Well, you know, that's the the Exile. That's the five original members in that band. Um, and um, this year, they are, they're celebrating, s well, 2023, excuse me, which almost this year, uh, they're celebrating 60 years as a band. Have you always been recording them too? Well, you were front of house engineer, I, I was about ready, tour that's, manager, that's, right? You asked me that because that's what I was about ready to say. Um, I, I was I was with Ronnie Millsap at the time, and I was doing Ronnie's monitors, you know, the stage monitors, and and um, I mean that's a whole nother, I mean that's a whole nother education. We could we could talk about we'll talk I mean, about ronnie in a minute. that you know yeah. Ra Ra randy rk taught taught me the motor skills of playing drums um Ron ronnie ronnie Millsap taught me how to listen you know he trained my ears um it, it's just just um, unbelievable the experience uh that i had uh, with him so Anyway, um, I, I wanted to start mixing front of house more, and um, a guy named Gary Kerbis, uh, who owns an entertainment company here in town. I, I knew Gary from I, I worked at a at a, uh, uh, an agency back in Columbus, Ohio, Concept Two Thousand. I met Gary booking bands at the time, but um, he knew I was kind of looking for a front of house gig, and and he was he was booking Exile at the time. And he told me about the the position that was open, and they had just gotten back together. You know, they were they were 
they were broken up for several years there as that original unit in any way. So, um, so I'm, I'm mixing front of house for these guys and, and we're on the bus, you know, all the time. And, and they're talking about doing these recordings, you know, and, and uh, it's tough to ring your own bell. It's, it's tough to say, well, I can do this or I can do that. And, but they would talk about doing these recordings and I would kind of be sitting on the bus, listening to them. I kind of just raised my hand. Hey, I'm a recording engineer. <laughs> and, you know, next weekend they're out talking, I raise my hand. Hey, I'm a recording engineer. And you know what I mean? Until um, what ended up happening was they wanted to do a, a 50 year live recording. Uh, and we're going to do it at the Franklin Theater in Franklin, uh, Tennessee. And so I multi I mix, I was I mixed the show at the theater. So there's a, anybody that, that there's an awesome theater. It's like 230 seats or something like that. The acoustics in it is incredible. Just it, it's just a, a, an awesome venue um, to do a, 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 a live recording video shoot. And this would have been like 2013, I think, something like that. So I multi track it. So that, you've been with them about a year when this show about a year. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, still haven't worked in the studio with them for about a year. And so you're mixing front of house and you're laying everything direct to whatever Pro Tools at the time. Yeah, recording yeah. multi tracking. Sure. They started coming here or wherever. We, we did some stuff at Blackbird. I, I, I can't remember. No, I wasn't at Blackbird then. I can't remember where, what all we used. But I started on this live record and I mixed it. I called Live at the Franklin Theater. And I mean, you should check it out. It, it, it's really good. You know, it's it's really good. And again, the guys were just getting back together. Um, so after that, um, um, I did a Christmas record with them. And then we did the um, re-released all the greatest hits record uh, called Hits, Exile Hits. So I did all that. So, you know, with modern technology, Pro Tools or whatever we were using, you know, uh, that, that gave us the the ability to redo these songs in, in the digital domain. Um, so it was all complete digital, you know, from the beginning to the, to, to the end. So, you know, the recordings, I guess are cleaner, whether or not that's better. <laughs> I, don't, I don't, that's a whole nother debate, isn't it? So, um, so anyway, so they, they yeah, that's, that's kind of how that worked, man, is, is, um, cause I had, you know, being a studio guy, um, studio, uh, engineer, session player i just i was teaching at a university here in town belmont university and and uh running their live audio program director of live audio and and digital consoles were just coming around for uh live audio the the yamahas the m7s and i could throw some numbers out there you know the, the avid venues and and you know teaching students how to run these digital consoles it was uh, you know again as us analog guys transitioning over to digital, but something about it was that, like especially with the with the Avid, the the, the D Show, the venue consoles, is they hooked up directly to Pro Tools. Now, this being the the, the digital live console, you, you know, we we would do we would do these showcases there at at, at Belmont and the Event Center, and, and we would multi track um, to Pro Tools off of these consoles the the bands that were basically Belmont entertainers who that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother, um, talk about talent, talent, good grief. The people that came out of that school, um, that went, went on to have major careers. But, um, so we record these artists in these showcases and then I would bring the students back into, uh, one of the studios and, um, we would remix the live recordings. This would have been, um, 2006, 2007, 2008, when all this started happening. Really not that long ago, huh? You know? So I started looking at this as like, again, transitioning from studio to live, thinking, well, okay, so what bands w really want is the energy of a live performance, but not a sterile studio environment uh, type thing. So the transition, I really put a lot of my energy into recording live audio okay and mixing live audio because it's i mean there's some engineers that just kind of freaks them out if they hear drums in their vocal track 
<laughs> you know, we're, you know, yes. we're, you know, you know, right you know, now, you know, you, in studio stuff, you have the drums isolated, the vocals are in another room, but, you know, cymbals bleeding into your, or bass guitar, bass guitar amp bleeding into your drum kit. And, and I just embrace that, you know, um, and make it all work as a, it probably comes from being a live musician is, is knowing how to take the sound of that stage and, and make the recording happen around the sound of that stage. You know, you know what I'm saying, and 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 in in the masses, you know, the uh, p people that go out and see a concert. I mean, that's what they're used to hearing. You you know what I mean? They're not in the studio all the time. They're not hearing isolated drums and isolated guitars and isolated vocals. They're hearing all that bleed that that happens in the stage. So, I mean, I really, um, I real, I I threw both feet, my whole body into this. This is is where this industry is going now everybody records live every night you know all these consoles you these engineers they record they take the band back to the studio and it, it's just but but at the time it was a new thing man and and i really preached to those students uh there at belmont at the time you need to learn how to do this you need to learn how to mix like this and this is when when you're at the end of the night as a front of house engineer that last note hangs, you know, in the auditorium or whatever, and you close up your console and you're done until the next show. Well, guess what? You're not done now, you know, because now you've got the recording and you can continue working on this. It's just, you know, it's just another way to, um, you know, make a living in, in, in the business is to have that follow through. So then with back to the exile thing that live at the Franklin theater, see, I've been, I've been teaching this, uh, this whole recording uh, concept and mic placement. And, you know, you do, a, you do some, you do some plexiglass guitar amplifier shields and, you know, you do some isolation live. Yeah, just to keep things from being saturated. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a certain way, place you set up. Don't, don't put the drum, put the drum kit off to the side, you know, just little, little, little things that, that you learn. Um, but that was kind of, that was something that I was teaching, but I had no idea that it was setting me up for something that would, I would do later on in my career being a live audio. Well, obviously the group loved what you did. I think so. You made this record. They loved yeah. it. So you're raising your hand and saying, Hey, yeah. guys, and you validated yourself. Yeah. These guys bring your own bell. My, my, they seem very say. comfortable working here with you. I noticed the relationship was wonderful. Um, yeah. Between you and the guys. And, uh, yeah. there's a lot of, uh, I was just gonna say love there and trust. Yeah. yeah. You gotta trust the people you're working with. Yeah. And, uh, well, you know, the live thing, I, I record LV every night um, off of my console. I travel with my own console. I record LV every night. And we did, did a his, we, we did a club tour last year. Well, beginning of this year, excuse me. And uh, he kind of headlined his club tour. And our last uh, show was at the Basement East, um, which is Nashville East right. Basement yeah. venue there. And I recorded it. Uh, we had uh, Tennille Towns was their guest uh uh, Lanny Wilson was there. Um, but I recorded LV and the label uh, wanted to release one of the songs I recorded um, called County Roads. So I brought the recordings uh, home here to the to the studio and edited and, and mixed. Um, and that's totally live. We didn't fix anything. So that's... We didn't fix anything, man. That's the version that's available now on Spotify and Apple. Yeah. And, yeah. Neat. Yeah. County Roads live. Um, and that was that. That came from me recording right off the console, uh, or off my front of house console, bringing the Pro Tools tracks home and mixing them and releasing them to the to the label. Well, one thing I noticed in your resume, Leon Redbone, correct? Yeah, I remember an old oh interview my. with him talking about live recording. What a smart! Gentleman. And he maybe it was Rolling Stone magazine years ago or something. He talked about recording. Yeah, and he talked about do you go out? Do you jump up on stage and stick your ear in a kick drum? Mm -hmm. So what well, you were so talking true. about, and so, that's so what audiences are afraid here. of that. So many engineers are afraid of that. Um, oh my God, you know, I, I I can hear bass guitar in my overheads, or so, you, you know, you, you just gotta. That, 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 but that's the way the audience hears that. They're yeah, gonna... it's kind of smeary, you know, and that kind of a thing. But um, well, you know, uh, Leon Redbone. I mean, what a giant! I mean, so so. Underrated. What year did you work with him? I was in Georgia. Um, 
uh, this was after Cowboys and I was just trying to find some pickup gigs. You know, okay. I, I was doing live audio. I, I really started getting into live audio after the Cowboys gig. Um, Matthew DiBenedetto's company and SSI was down there at the time. I'm um, glad you mentioned him. Another yeah. friend of ours. Yeah. 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 Matthew, love him dearly. He's another guy. He really, he knew, he knew that I was going to get let go at Cowboys um, that night. He was the front of house guy there. At Cowboys, he knew I was going to get let go, and he ran. In, he saw me backstage. He knew my engineering background. He saw me backstage. He goes, "Hey, man, you know if you you ever need work, man, you ever need to do any work, my production company, I could I could, I could use you." So and he did, he, he, and he did, and uh, so I was out working uh, 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 West Carrollton. What's the university out there? At Twenty. Anyway, Leon was doing a show there, and and. Um, I was mixing it. It's a high school theater, and part of the um, part of his show was getting together with the students, the college students, prior to the show, and just sitting down and doing a little chat, you know. And uh, William, I just I, I just fell in love with this guy. His 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 wit, his intelligence. I had no idea, you know. I had no idea, and I had him I had him sign a poster for me, and and he goes, yeah, okay, yeah. So what is? It? I says Tony. And he goes, oh, Tony, yeah, that's why not backwards. <laughs> and, I, you know, it, 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 it might seem silly, but it just had that kind of mind, you, you know, why not? And, and that's kind of like, it's kind of like my personality. Sure, I'll do it. Why not? <laughs> he, 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 I don't know. Anyway, he, um, Leon, man, he's awesome. Um, I, I remember seeing him before I ever worked with him back in Columbus, Ohio. This had been the 70s. I, I, I think it was like he was opening up for maybe like Fog Hat or something. You know what they used to. They, oh, that's fantastic. With, yeah, yeah, yeah. Leon yeah. Redbone in front of. Yeah, what the, you know, what they, for the what city, they used to right? do yeah. is, you know, you pay all this money for a big band like Fog Hat. This would be in the seventies, you know, and then when it came to an opening act, you could only afford an acoustic act, you know, um, or something. But anyway, there was Leon, and you know, shine on harvest moon kind of thing. I'm that a voice. singer, I'm a drummer, and uh, at the end of his show, this is like when pyro was starting to go on, right? So at the end, here he is, you know, he's got a he he, he has this little red brick that's his kick drum. You mic it up, yeah. he just taps this red brick. It's it's his, it's his kick drum mic, and it's just he's got this old timey radio that you mic up, and it, it, it's he's some of the stuff that this stage props. But anyway, his very last song, he, he's playing acoustic gu guitar, and he does that. Um, crash him up, bang, bang stuff, you know, you uh -huh. do. Yeah. Guitar, and, 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 and the very end of it, there's this little puff of smoke that goes, poof. <laughs> this is a How did that man. audience, oh a my God, fog hat, like, rock oh, and roll crowd, yeah, yeah, yeah. probably half of them, 90% of them stoned out of their minds are watching Leon Redbone do this thing, yeah. and they're just digging it. In this medium probably never heard of him. Oh, no. Uh -huh, but uh -huh. they were they were being introduced to greatness. To greatness, and and, yeah. and and this one little flash pod in the back, poof! Oh, that goes off. It was I, classic, man. I mean, I never forgot it. It was just he just he just, he just creates a parody of himself. I, I don't know if that's the right. Word I wonder if not, him and Zappa ever had a conversation together. Boy, wouldn't that be crazy? I, I would like to. I want to listen to that on the wall between Zappa and Leon Redbone. That would have been a so as uh, tour manager duties. You have to be careful with those those jobs and that. Um, you know. I, you know, you know, we do this to make a living. I, you know, I, I, I've not become a rich man in terms. Of, I don't, I don't have a yacht or a private island or anything like that. But, but I, I live a good life. I'm comfortable, and um, you, you, you know, you get. I try, try to keep this positive and say this. But, but as, as a young engineer, as a young engineer going out um, for not the, what money. Sh should you should be going out for and carry and, and doing all these hats oh yeah I, I can i can production manage i can mix and i can tour manage and get paid the same as if i was a front of house engineer is a really big mistake okay this is a really big mistake okay so um you know what i a straight ahead tour, tour manager um for a, a major artist does well for a living you know um there there then there are 
uh, people like me that would do, okay, I'm a front of house guy and I'm a tour manager where you still need to be, you still need to get paid for that tour managing part of it. You know, the, the, if you hire me to do front of house, um, that way does not include tour managing. Gotcha. <laughs> you know, because I mean, it, 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 it takes your life. A tour manager is your life. I mean, you are constantly booking hotels and booking flights and, oh man, it, 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 I mean, it is, it's a, it's a, it's a cool gig, but it's an intense gig and, and it, and it takes up all your time. And, um, by trying to be a pilot and a flight attendant. (laughs) Boy, that's great, man. Can I have that? So Um, you're trying to fly the plane and, uh, Hey, can we get some peanuts in seat? Yeah. 13 a, uh, all right. Yeah, sure. So with Exile, Steve uh, Getzman also was a manager kind of guy. He and I kind of split duties. I did a lot of the, I did a lot of the tour managing, and he did some of it, and it kind of took some of the relief off of me. So that that worked. We kind of had our routines. Like you handle meet and greets, and I handle the hotels, and you do this and you do that, and and we kind of split it up. Job description was defined. It was yeah. definitely definitely was defined, and it, we realized, you know, it was it was a good relationship with those guys, and that if if I was busy, I couldn't do one particular thing that day, and then Steve would pick up, or if I see it, Steve had to do a meet and greet, or he had radio or something, I would pick up, and you know, it's a give and take. Even though you 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 have your defined um, job descriptions, you, you, you know, you can't be that rigid with it. I mean, it's the music business, you know. Um, so it, you know, I, I, Diamond Rio was what a what a great bunch of guys and man, the, you know, those songs, you know. So um, I left Exile and joined Diamond Rio, and um, um, it was a very short lived thing, three months or something like that. Um, and um, I, I had, I don't know, I guess I had this v- vision that I was going to go out and be this audio guy, and it, it was about. It, on a show day, it was like it was like sixty minutes of audio and twenty three hours of tour managing, you know, and, and it's just not what no sleep. <laughs> well, I guess I did sleep, but then, you, <laughs> but well, then there's I was you, being facetious. Well, you, well, yeah. you you would be yeah. sleeping, and then and then they wake you up and go, "Hey, do you have the credit card? We need to get fuel. Do you have the credit card? We need to get you know." So you really don't you know sleep the whole time, but um um so so it. You know, my passion is not tour managing, and 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 I don't want to make that sound bad. To, to, it's not. To, it was a to, question I was going to ask you because you've worn so many hats. Yeah. What's your favorite? You know. Yeah, it's just not my passion, and so um, uh, I, I wasn't the, the I it, it, we 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 you know uh, they they uh, always make the make the joke as yeah I, I went I went to bus call with those guys and the bus wasn't there. They moved a bus call and didn't tell me where it was. And that's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, they, they just kind of, I, I, what I tried to do was kind of divvy that kind of like exile did. I did with exile. It's like, Hey guys, if you could just like maybe do this and do that, I wouldn't have to do all of this tour managing kind of thing. And, but that's not what they've, you know, the, the, the 30 years they've been out there, that's not how they operate. You know, they have their own way that they want to operate. And, um, I wasn't going to change that. Um, and so we parted ways, you know, it just didn't work. It just didn't work out. So questions I really want to get to. Jimmy Bowen's show is great. Now he gets a lot of great uh, high profile guests. How often do you tape that? We, I, I just finished, by the way, I just finished the um, last episode on season five with Jimmy. Uh, it's called Jimmy Bowen and Friends. Uh, my production company, we do the, we provide the PA and the lighting. We were recording down in Murfreesboro at um, Ridenour Studios. Um, we, they, they, they do it in front of a live audience. It's, for, it's in front of a live audience. With the, with, there's 12 episodes per season. Um, uh, Ty Herndon, Radney Foster, um, uh, John Barry, Rhonda Vincent, Buddy Jewel, Joel Sonia, John. Steve did you know John in Atlanta? Was that a reunion of sorts? Did you know John Barry? You when know you what I did, in? And, and John was uh, he was the Athens guy. Yeah, right over there in Athens. Well, he was in Atlanta. He moved to Athens. Our paths never crossed. I, I think that didn't didn't he kind of didn't he kind of get his deal and kind of he was on Capitol when the other Jimmy Bowen. Yeah, and any, any of you folks who've been in the business for a while, this is not that Jimmy Bowen. Uh, this is Jimmy Bowen, uh, uh, singer, songwriter, bluegrasser. But what a great show. I've, I've caught on it's YouTube. Cool show, Where man. else can people watch it? 
um, Heartland, um, Circle TV. We we just I, I I just heard. I don't know if I can really announce this, but it's going into into regular syndication. Um, a guy out of L.A. loves the show, and um, this coming year it will be syndicated in the major networks. So uh, you can find it on YouTube. And you've been with the show for five years. I've been with Jimmy from the beginning. That's fantastic. Yeah. 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 It was. We did our very first show was a pilot we did with Daryl Singletary. It's a great. Great band. Yeah. His band is great. The sound is the audio is great. So that's Thanks, that's your live. I record that live. That's your live skills coming to work. It and is, then, man. It's and right there. It is, dude. There it is. I mean, you know what I mean. It's just. I mean, that's my that's my that's my bread and butter. How hard is that to 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 make something sound good for that studio audience and at the same time send another signal? Well, we have we have three engineers on that show. Um, we have a front of house guy who mixes for the audience. We we have a monitor guy who mixes to the stage, and I'm off into a I'm off into an isolation room multi tracking. So so you're recording the live audio. Yeah, I'm for just the broadcast for broadcasting. I bring those tracks back. Are you mixing on the fly, or do you go well, back and do how much post production? A, a, a production mix. You know, I do a little two mix that goes to video. And video will do the editing off that two mix, and then they send the video to me, and then I do the final mix off the multi track to the video. Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm not mixing. Not like what I was, I was talking about with LV. Um, I'm mixing hit the audience show and a multi tracking at the same time. You know, um, this is kind of there in the background, kind of running the multi track is. So, in, in this, you're case, just making sure the levels are good, so you can go back and yeah, yeah, just mix. good levels yeah. and that kind of thing. And you know, you, I know that the sounds are going to be okay. I mean, you know, they're and all. But, hey, but, but Jimmy, I, I'm just, I'm just, I just got, I'm, just, I just got at my multi track uh, world um, set up. So we, we, we do three weeks of rehearsals. Um, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy's, so during, so the ch- show, the way that works is Jimmy will do two songs. The guest artist would do two songs and there's two interviews. So, um, so a lot of dialogue, a lot of music. So Jimmy opens up the show, introduces the artist. They do an interview of two or three minutes. The, the guest artist plays a song. They come back and do another interview. The guest artist plays another song. Jimmy comes back, outros the show, and he does another song. So um, each, each episode um, out of the 12 episodes, I mix four songs and two interviews. <laughs> so that's 48 songs. At over how many days is this? Uh, well, it takes me about five months. It takes me five months to but miss the season. But the actual taping of the show, how, how many days is uh, this? We did tape it in four days. Uh, we do so you do 12 three, episodes in four days? 12 episodes in four days. We do right. three artists per night. Um, Does the audience flip, or is it the same audience? If you go to a taping, are you, you safe? The same all? audience, mostly. Okay, well, that's cool. Yeah, mostly. We, we are, um, if, if anybody's listening there, we're, we, 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 we were in a smaller venue, and we're we going to be in a bigger venue. We're going to be taping the last week in, in uh, January of 2023, and we're going to be at the Troubadour Theater. And oh, over off Music Valley Drive? Yeah, yeah. yeah, right back there. Yeah. Um, Oh, geez, uh, back behind uh, Nashville Palace. Uh, yeah, so uh, we're going to be moving the show there. And uh, hopefully, um, you, we, we were down in Murfreesboro, kind of in this warehouse area, and, and it just wasn't, we couldn't get the tourists, you know, um, uh, there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we would love to really beef up the audience. Um, if you want to check out Jimmy's show, I mean, probably the quickest way to do it is just jump on YouTube. Yeah, that's Jimmy Bowen and friends just jump on YouTube and check that out. Um, but yeah, man, we're heading into season six, season six. And we're, we're, we, we, there's plans next year to take it on the road. I think we're going to have a stop in Texas, you know, where, what we'll do. Is Isn't that where he's from? Was he originally a Texas he, guy? He's a, he's a Texas artist. We actually, yeah. I, I, I record studio stuff with him. Uh, we got a song coming out next month. Uh, Texas Red Dirt Country is called. That is an entire nation unto its own. There's a whole yeah. Texas music industry. Whole, they have their own charts. They have their own charts. They have yeah. their own. Yeah, you, know, you could you could make a living in Texas and never leave the state. Yeah. So and Jimmy is is one of those artists, and yeah. and, um, and we 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 do a couple of releases a year on the Texas charts. And I just finished a mix. We recorded it here, kind of a studio thing, and it's not a live thing; it's a studio uh, thing. We did an, an old remake of a Merle Haggard song called "Big City." Yeah, and uh, it's going to be uh, check it out, Texas Radio, Big City, Jimmy Bowen. 
Um, yeah, it's cool. Will he do it in the uh, in the next season? Will he perform it? Yeah, we did it season five or four. We any did, we, uh, we any guests you can give us? Uh, Upcoming guests? Yeah, that you're allowed to talk well, about? Well, right now, I know the Goldens. The Goldens are going to be on yeah. there, uh, which is William Lee Golden from the yeah, sure. Oaks and, and his sons. Yeah. Goldens. Um I'm not. I'm not sure who else they have right now. I'm right. sure that, that. Well, check out Jimmy Bowen okay. on YouTube. Look for the Jimmy Bowen show. Jimmy Bowen and Friends. And Friends. Favorite venue that you've mm-hmm. ever had an opportunity to work in. This is going to be out there, right? There's there's a um, every year called Frontier Days in Cheyenne, Wyoming. It's a rodeo. It's a big, massive rodeo. And I did it with Millsap, and then we just did it this year with uh, LV. Um, and Brooks and Dunn, we opened up for Brooks and Dunn, and and it, 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 it's, it's crazy. Uh, look this stuff up online. Uh, Frontier Days, they have some video of the stage. So with the way these rodeos work is they have the rodeo during the day, right, and then the rodeo wraps up, and then the stage rolls out to the arena. Okay, so this as a, this stage was built off of space shuttle technology. Okay. This is like Super Bowl halftime entertainment oh my stuff, God. right? It's crazy. It's coming out in Cheyenne. We're right. You, so what you do, you're already set up on the stage, and they pull it out with these massive the contractors, and it, it looks it, it's the same basic idea of the space shuttle. That's where they got basically the blueprints with it. So we're, I, I, I ride the stage out, man. It's fun as crap. So so uh, anyway, you ride out on the stage. It goes out in front of the grandstands, and then the wheels turn ninety degrees. And then the whole stage kind of backs up again. If you ever watch a space shuttle being transported, sure, it's the same. It's the same idea. Um, but what a cool gig! What about cabling? Are we, everything hooks up after you get out there. You no, know, like one huge snake coming no, out. No, no, it's, it's, it's the stage is pre-wired. You know, the power, everything's pre-wired. You, your your front of house consoles. Um, but the lighting, set everything up. is already on the stage. Everything lighting, is, everything is already yeah, up on that stage. There. Yeah, all we have to do then is once it gets out there, is then the the uh, the stage just needs to be networked with the front of house consoles and then power hooked up. But you've already had a rehearsal. Everything's you've had a chance to pre mix and it's already been done. Yeah, and it's you just recall it. Yeah, after everything's plugged back in. Yeah. So it's it's like thirty thousand people in the audience. It just and you know out the, out there with 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 you know we typically get some kind of a sound check. You know, so like on on this show it rained and it rained and it rained and we didn't get a sound check. And so, um, so uh, here here come here comes Alvy here come here comes the band and I'm basically just kind of pulling up the main fader and just going, all right. You know, talk about yeah. the Wild West, man. You know, here, here we are. <laughs> Let's see what happens. And, um, you know, just uh, grab grab a hold and here we go. That makes me nervous. That's like, to me, that's the equivalent of like oh, standing intense, on man. the edge of a cliff. It's making, oh, it's, it's, it's a cringe it, moment. It, 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 so how long did it take you to not, get, get things right? Things. How long did it take where you went, okay, it's under control? Song. You so know, you were comfortable. Yeah, it's, song it's and you're, you're, you're good. You know, you, we... we, we, we you, you save settings, you know, uh, the, the way the, the, the PA is EQ'd. I, 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 I have savings yeah. that I kind of, sure. you know, I, we played, we played this festival in Wisconsin last week and we were on this PA. So I have this JBL line array EQ that I know kind of works. It worked then. So you're in the right neighborhood. You're in the yeah. right zip code. Yeah. You kind of yeah. have to, I save all my shows. So, uh, so oh, you got totally so you carry just, a flash drive. Is yeah, it's just a matter of recalling a show that fits a past show, and you're able. You know that going yeah. in. Yeah, so it's not like totally. You've totally got cold. something to not like totally cold. All right, most memorable career moment. Well, okay, so um, I, I, you know, it, it, I, I guess you could take it all the way back to. Uh, I guess that the thing about you know we're just talking about getting in front of 30,000 people and, and pulling up the master fader and, and let's see. I, I think that, that, that you kind of have to, you, it's, it, you have to have that in your blood. You have to be that person who would jump out of an airplane. You know that, you know, you, um, so, um, you know, you put yourself in, in, in situations, um, that challenge are, yourself, challenge yourself that yeah. are intense. So, um, the very first, 
uh, out big outdoor football stadium show that I mixed was at Nissan Stadium, and um, which where the Titans play. You know, here in town. Yes. Um, and um, wow, I mean, it was like, I mean, that, I mean, for me, Who that was, was that a really, that was Exile. And exile. We, were, it, it, we were doing, now I had done CMA, I've done that stage before with Millsap, with Ronnie, but as a monitor engineer, but, but, but it's different when you're out front, you know, mixing t- t- to all those people in that stadium. It's CMA Fest. It was a CMA fest, um, and we were on the the ticket. Keith Urban was on a uh, little big town that night. Um, so what happens? Uh, that does the engineer just change seats? Like, were you doing the entire show? That no, night? I just did ac- mixed exile. What every so every artist has their own engineer. And so you you've got a few minutes to pull your mix up. And yeah, we get it. We get it. we yeah. did, we did sound check that so day. What was that like to hear that many people screaming in your ear? Man, I tell you what, I just you know you're you're in the sweet spot. Yeah, but you've got you're surrounded by um, what fifty, sixty thousand. Well, it's screen? powerful, man. It's yes, it's, it's it's a it's a it's a powerful. Is it emotional? It's a powerful. It is emotional. It is emotional. You want to do your best, and and um, it, you know, man, I just I I came from pretty meager beginnings and um, not not much money as a kid. Uh, and, 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 you know, you work hard, you know, you work hard for things in your career and, um, and you know, you get to, you get to moments like that and you go, I mean, it's not like, okay, wow, I made it, but it's just like, man, here, you know, here, here's a little bit of a reward, you know, for the, for I call it validation, and, validation, validation of your dream, validation of your, you know, your aspirations, you know, this is something you worked for. This is something you made those sacrifices for. You know, yeah. you spend all your time developing your craft in so many areas, not only drums, but uh, in audio. How many of your students have gone on, your audio students? <laughs> uh, have you ran into them? Are you know, any of your students you know, doing you know, there, tours you know, now? You know, there's this, there's this joke out there with Alvy's band and all his musicians. Um, yeah, I, I wonder I wonder how many in- engineers on the festival today Tony has taught, you know, um, and and. and and, and, and you know, man, I I don't even want to try to. I, I'm a pretty modest person, you know. Um, but I've had a lot of students and and, and some monsters, man. There's just some monsters out there, you know, uh, mixing national acts, and uh, I run into them all the time. You know, there's one. Uh, in, in, I'll mention him real quick. Named Joe Kaiser. Um, jo, Joe is uh, right now. He's he, he's he mixes front of house for Nickelback. And b- before that, he was ZZ Top's front of house guy, blah, blah, blah. But he was my drum student back in Ohio when he was 10 years old. Wow. Okay. And he took the path, too. Now he's... Well, and, in and, and he would come to the recording workshop, and I was talking about doing all those recordings, and he would assist me. And when I left the recording workshop to go to Atlanta, my job as an instructor there opened up. So I got him through the school. He took my job as a teacher there. He moved to Atlanta. I mean, he moved to Nashville same time I moved to Nashville and really pursued the live audio thing. And he he is, uh, I mean, Joe Kaiser is the, the number one student of my entire life that started out when he was 10 years old, a little toe head, coming into the music store with his drum book and his sticks to learn some rudiments, you know. And and, and he's still just he's just killing it, man. And it's it's really it's really neat to see, you know. And we're we're he's probably my best friend. You know, I think there's a ten year age difference. I think it's about a pretty solid ten year age difference. Doesn't you know, seem like that much today. It doesn't. And the older you get the, the it, gap nah, narrows. At at that time at that time it did. Um but man, there's a there's a student to to mention. You know, I, I guess just the thing that about, I would say one last thing here, with anybody getting into this industry or in this industry, okay, is you can't be afraid to fail. You know, that's that's the biggest one, I think, as humans, that, that we, we just want to always do the right thing. We don't, we don't want to fail. But failing, it, 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 it's never fun at the time, but it's the most educational um, um, um was it Thomas Edison said, I, I, uh, I haven't failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. I think it was that Thomas Edison that said that. I found 10,000 ways that don't work, never fail. But, but that would be my advice to anybody in coming into this business or thinking about this business. One last question. 
your bucket list, career-wise? What's the one thing on your bucket list that you haven't done yet that you would like to do? Is there somebody you'd like to tour with, mm. mix for, record, or just another area of the industry that you would... Uh, well, this is going to sound kind of self-centered now, isn't it? But uh, I, I, I would like to I would like to to, to have some acknowledgement of of what I did, why I was here, you know. Um, boy, wouldn't we like to have a Grammy? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm doing TV stuff. Maybe maybe a telly. They call you telly awards or um, Emmy. <laughs> and I mean, I'd like to thank the. Uh, yeah, I mean, just you know, uh, 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 some recognition for for the uh, for my work would would you know what you know that would be kind of cool. If it doesn't happen, that's okay. My work's still there, right? Well, I think that those that know you, that's a long list. We didn't even get to talk about you know people like Vince Gill and other artists that you've had yeah. the opportunity to work with. So. We'll revisit another day. Tony, thank you for your time. Appreciate I'd love to come back and talk to you, William, or you come back and we'll talk do to that me soon. or whatever it is. <laughs> we will do it. All right. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Pod 615 with host William Kitchens. We hope you'll subscribe to the podcast on this streaming platform and give us a five-star rating and review. Follow us on Instagram at the Pod 615 and on facebook.com forward slash pod 615. Find us on the internet at pod615.com for blogs, show notes, and transcripts. Would you like to be on the show? Have someone you'd like to hear interviewed? Pod 615 also offers featured guest opportunities for qualifying subject matter. Email william at pod615.com for more information about this and other podcast production opportunities. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>